Welcome to the newest uh, brainchild. Uh, this is going to be a podcast of Representative Heath Sessions and Representative Brandon Guffey, and we're going to call it Pints and Politics. Um, we have been lucky enough to, al- to have Schiller Hamilton Law Firm allow us to record in their podcast uh, yep. booth, and we are getting sponsored by Comer Distributing. So the entire purpose of this is to talk about what is going to be going on um, yep. on a weekly basis, get our personal opinions before you know, we're actually on the floor debating things um, and to enjoy a local pint uh, that is distributed from Comer. Yeah. Yeah. Or so. many of our fine other breweries around Rock Hill, yes. York County. So, uh, well, hey, man, cheers to you. Cheers. Uh, today we're drinking the uh, Sycamore Southern Girl Blonde Ale. Cheers. So cheers to you. So, I think this all started as um, our motivation was. We were freshman members last year, and, man, we were drinking from a fire hose, Yeah, you know, for, <laughs> for five, six months, um, and just to better communicate with the districts yeah. of, of Rock Hill and York County. Um, we thought we had um, communicated well with some of even our friends and uh, maybe our, our voters, and you and I would get text messages or, or emails from folks who thought they knew us really well. And there seemed to be a lot of confusion on some pretty common sense issues that yeah we, made we thought, sense. Yeah, yeah, we were in lockstep. It's so. funny how rumors get started. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, we're like, you know what? We we need to uh, maybe let's let's go on the offense. Let's get proactive. Let's. I mean, um, how much more transparent can you be to right. discuss how you feel about something before it starts? Yeah, they can see how you vote, and then you can explain every vote. Right. Um, not just on the voting aspect of it, but. And I think we learned this too as freshmen coming in. I came in, my I, I am. Um, for those of you that don't know our personalities, Heath is like a chess master. I don't even know how Stop to explain it. it. <laughs> <laughs> he has a unique ability to remember everyone's name, to remember exactly everything that's said, um, and he is very strategic and understands how to get things going. Whereas me, I'm more emotional and. It's how I feel at the time, and I move forward that way. But it worked out well because many times you kept me from harming myself whenever I wanted to go nuclear <laughs> over an issue. Um, yeah, I, I'm just a little more measured. I'm a little more, uh, you know, I want to get all sides of an yeah. issue. Um, even though I may have my personal or I, I think I have my, my finger on the pulse of District 46, which is Rock Hill proper for the right. most part. Um but I still, even though I, th- I think I know, I want to hear from the quote unquote experts on certain yeah. issues, you know. And so, hearing all sides and and um, whereas you know in floor debates, we'll we'll get these snarky comments from, you know, just opponents of the issue or opponents of a bill, and you're like, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm, I'm yeah. asking a question, I'm, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 but uh, it's it's a good it's a good uh, yin yang. As, as freshmen, we learn, though, that just because we raise our hand to ask a question, we're usually the last ones yeah. that they get to. Um, so that's one of the things that frustrates me on committee, especially, you know, I'm on judiciary, you're on 3M. Yeah. But as things are coming through, you know, you raise your hand to make a comment. And then on, on my committee, of course, I've got Bamberg, which is always going to talk for a long time. <laughs> um, but by the time it gets to me, those questions have been answered. Yeah. So, first of all, why don't we go ahead and explain your committee assignments last year. Okay. And uh, what they include, and then I'll go with mine as well. Yep. So, freshman year, um, and just for folks who, who don't understand the process, um, as a newly elected member of the, the House of Representatives here in South Carolina, um, as a freshman member, you can make two or three of your top line requests for committees. Generally that's, um, you know, say in downtown Rock Hill, I don't need to be on an ag- the ag committee. Right. You know, 
I'm dealing with a lot of urban issues, um, municipal issues. And so um, I, I told the speaker and leadership, I was like, guys, I, y'all put me wherever you need me. I mean, I, my background is business. Um, I'm the vice president of a construction company. We employ about 150 people. So naturally, I wanted to be on labor, commerce, and industry, but I'm also a reasonably minded that that's a more powerful committee. So yeah. Um, so I, I was put on 3M, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I'm on the medical subcommittee. And last year, you know, dealing with a certificate of need, that the reform and repeal of that, um, I got to see that, you know, front and center. So, well, it, real quick, it's funny that uh, you brought up the certificate of need because that was one of the things. Because I knew that you and Senator Clymer and Senator Clymer had the certificate of need bill. Mm -hmm. We're really working on it, and people kept coming up to me and asking me. And at the time, I remember stepping outside, and it was a. Uh, uh, couple of Freedom Caucus members came up to me and they said, where are you voting on certificate of need? And I said, wherever rep sessions vote. <laughs> they were like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I don't need to understand it because I know that Senator Clymer's bill and Wes and Heath have been working on this. And that's their most important thing is to get this passed. Right. And I'm not going to do anything to mess this up. So I, I know that anything that Heath submits or requests is on behest of what Wes is working on as well to get this done. Right, right. And there was a lot of work done. I mean, in in learning about that issue last year as a member, there was a lot of work done well before we got there. Um, and I think originally Harvey Peeler and our speaker, Merle Smith, started talking about this issue like a decade ago. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so uh, I think Senator Davis out of um, – Buford. Yep. He had picked it up. And then as he took the mantle on the medicinal marijuana, uh, Senator Clymer, our, our friend Wes, picked it up here recently and, and really took it uh, over the finish line. So, um, so yeah, so that that's my committee assignment. Um, so let's talk about yours. You got on so, the, uh, the big dog committee. I got on judiciary. Um, like you said, you're supposed to, you know, request three committees. I didn't. I requested one. <laughs> Um, and primarily because Gavin's Law was going to be on there. Um, and whenever I sat down with the speaker, he said, uh, you know, do you have any experience on judiciary? And I said, no, not at all. <laughs> hey, you know, having and, a non-lawyer uh, yeah. amongst lawyers is helpful. Well, that became my argument. If, if I can't understand it, then how will the people back home understand it? Yeah. Um, so I thought that it was important to have a voice on there. And he asked me what I was most qualified for. And I said, probably ag. You know, I've had a landscaping business for the oh, past right, 15 right. years and, you know, landscape supply. And uh, but, you know, it wasn't where my passion was. And I tell people that ever since everything happened, I am my focus is solely on protecting kids. Mm -hmm. And I felt like judiciary was the best way to do that. Now, of course, I'm a weak member on judiciary, I would say, compared to uh, the attorneys, but the first year is a lot of listening and yeah. learning. Yeah, correct. Um, and we started off with fentanyl trafficking. Yeah. Which well, was. <laughs> and, and so that, that segues into why, why don't we just go ahead and recap, um, you know, first year experiences. Um, you know, this time last year, I remember telling folks two things, certificate of need and the fentanyl trafficking bill. Yes. You know, realistically, uh, I thought those were reasonable goals, you know, um, it's great to have, um, you know, a homer at your first at bat, but it's unlikely, right. you know. So I wanted to set, you know, singles, doubles, score runs. Let's get fentanyl trafficking with the mandatory minimums. Yes. And let's get certificate of need. Um, and, you know, to the credit of both the House, the Senate, and the governor, man, you know, we got those done. Um, I mean, they are in law today. Um, but, man, was it a battle. It, it was. It was. <laughs> and, uh and, but to boot, not only did, did we get the, the state fentanyl trafficking bill done, the reform of certificate of need and full repeal of certificate of need here in by 27, we also got Gavin's Law. Yeah, and that, that it, and to start off the year, you know, Gavin's Law was my number one. Fentanyl trafficking was my number two. Right. Um, and fentanyl is killing more youth than anything else in this country. So whenever we started off, with fentanyl trafficking, you know, I made a lot of rookie mistakes of uh, I bypassed committee uh, or subcommittee chair and committee chair members um, 
And, you know, my opinion was, I don't really care what they think anyway. This I'm down here to represent people. Um, what I found was... Mind your manners. It wasn't even that. It, it you know... Because I did it too. You know, but people say, kiss the ring, so to say. And I've always been the guy that said, I'm not kissing right. the ring. I not don't care who that. you are. Yeah, I, if you want, yeah. you want I'm just to see as me man, to do something. I'm just as man as you yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, so I'm never going to be that guy. But... What I did learn whenever I went to these subcommittee chair members afterwards, after I'd found out that I had ruffled feathers by my approach, um, was that it they were actually in agreement with me. Mm-hmm. It was just the fact that they were newly appointed into a leadership position, and then you have this freshman that just says, "I don't just, even care for just what you've off. done." Yeah, right. To get here. Yep. Um, and I also think because I did a little bit too on the fentanyl trafficking, um, just bypassing a subcommittee chair. But and, now uh, I want to say this because people don't realize how much work or how much credit you deserve in the fentanyl trafficking bill. Um, with the conversation, we had multiple conversations. So for people that don't know, me and Heath, not only are districts side by side, we mm-hmm. are desk mates. Yep. We are suite mates. And then in Columbia, we are roommates. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so we talk about this stuff quite a bit. And a lot of our conversations – you know, um, or, or combine the two of us. But Heath worked really hard with solicitors to get information. And I, to me, what helped me convince, and if you go back and look at the video of us passing the fentanyl trafficking bill, you don't see me and Heath getting up there as freshmen and debating this. And I remember taking Adam Morgan and Jordan in the back room, and I'm arguing with them because they didn't yep. want uh, Adam mandatory Morgan, minimums. Adam Morgan from Taylor's, uh, South yeah. Carolina, and Jordan Pace is from, I believe it's Somerville? Berkeley, Dorchester. Yeah, yeah, he's in that area. But uh, Jordan Pace is also a freshman member yeah. with us. And, and they're both, they both have more of a libertarian mind, which I, I tend to fall into. Mm-hmm. Um, but their argument was they don't like mandatory minimums. Right. Well, the argument quickly became you can't claim that we have a corrupt judiciary system and that we need to replace judges, and then you want to put the power in the judge's hands. Right. So right. why not? And this is the number one killer. We've got to have a mandatory minimum. And I remember Adam saying, you've got to get up there and argue this. Yes. And I said, absolutely not. I yeah. said, I'm a freshman. I get up there. Todd Rutherford's going to chew me alive, <laughs> and yep. then yeah, I don't yeah. want to be the reason that fentanyl trafficking doesn't pass. Correct. But it was with all the stats and everything that you combined to show – the number of pills that it took because the argument was, the oh, weight. someone's going to get weight. arrested with six That's right. pills. Um, yeah, that you weight. You pull in all those issue. stats and us pulling them back, and you'll see me and Heath basically divided the House floor pulling people yeah, in the back to get people back let, there to let, look at the stats. Let the, the veteran folks who, um, you know, your Tommy Popes, your Jeff Johnsons, the folks who are shepherding that officially through committee. Right. Let them handle the uh, the frontal assaults, verbal assaults from uh, a representative Rutherford, for instance, or, or, or somebody else who's opposing a mandatory minimum. You and I were running around the room trying to make sure that we had the votes. Yeah, and I, and I have a habit of pissing people off, <laughs> things that I say. I'm a little direct at times. <laughs> so my fear was that I would go up there week one. I would say something that would be completely misconstrued, or I would come off um, – very aggressive, right. and then that would cause me problems whenever I'm trying to get Gavin's bill. Mm-hmm. You know, people would make this assumption of, oh, this is this guy. Um, right. So I was trying to do more listening than yeah. talking, and you helped me a lot of times with that. I can't tell you how many times Heath, uh, whenever I wanted to jump up and say something, and Heath kind of gives me the tug, like, not yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that fentanyl trafficking bill, again, um, success is a team sport. Yeah. And man, we had a lot of support locally. Um, you know, for folks who don't know York County, South Carolina, we had a large bust. Yep. Um, what was it? Like 70 pounds. It was enough I to mean, kill everyone in the state. What was it? Twice. Three, yeah. yeah. Something like that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, whether it was, um, David Brackett personally, Sheriff Tolson, Kevin um, Brackett, I mean, Kevin Brackett, excuse <laughs> me. Yeah. Uh, Tolson or, or their staffs. Yeah. I mean, they were just tremendous. Many a times after session at night, I remember riding down the road on speakerphone talking with solicitors yep, <laughs> or the Sheriff's yep. Association. Yeah, correct. Um, and trying to figure these things out. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, that was the first time. Now, you had experience in the house, and I didn't know this. Whenever we, whenever um, I first spoke to you about running for the position, oh, I never yeah. knew that you were a page. Yeah. So I had zero experience whatsoever. I'd never sat in a house meeting. Yep. Um, I'd p- paid attention to what the headlines say and what things were doing, but I'd never sat and watched an entire Well, session. I mean, the, the, the view's a little different from the page chair than it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you knew how to get things done. And that was a benefit. Some institutional. And not just that. I mean, we also had, so with Gavin's Law, the freshmen um, would gather around our desk every Tuesday before we started to talk about how we could get things done. And that yeah. allowed us to not only talk about Gavin's Law, but other things that we were working on. And you seem to be the guy between you, Cody Mitchell, Gary Brewer. Y'all always knew ways to, okay, this is the steps that we need to go. Right. As opposed to more emotional people like, say, myself or a Lieber right. or a Beach. Well, you know, I think we, we had different approaches. <laughs> yeah. In, in anything you're doing, whether it's government work or your small business work or, you know, if you're working out of school. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about the relationships. It's about it's not so much where you want to go. It's, it's how do you get there and, and the team that you need to get there. And so understanding the personal relationships along the way that you can ask for help, right? Yeah. And especially in noble causes, whether it's fentanyl trafficking, uh, tax reform, or Gavin's Law, you know, you can, you can find some. Asking for help, you, you say that. I remember, you know, this was one of them days where I was about to blow everything up. Oh, I, I was remember. ticked off, and it was the night before, and we came back in, and it, it was our group that we call the porch caucus of people that live in the same condo that hang out and solve the world's problems. Yep. On the back porch. And everyone saying, uh, Guffy, you need to calm down. I'm like, nah, screw that. I'm about to, (laughs) I'm about to go ham on this and, uh, showing up. And that morning, as soon as I, as soon as we sat down, no one had said anything, done anything. And we we, we basically made a plan (laughs) on on the porch the the prior evening and said, Hey, and we basically delegated some, and we even prayed. That, we even said a prayer that night. And yeah. then that morning we show up before we can implement anything. We had literally done the prayer on the house floor, yeah. done our pledge, <laughs> you know, and sat down. And, and what happens? Weston Newton walks up and said, who, hey, who, who who's chair? the chair of judiciary and said, hey, we're going to hear your son's bill next week. Hey, yeah. Get ready. And as soon as that happened, I've looked at Heath and I was like, what did you do? And of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. Brandon Cox back in the back was like, Heath, what'd you do? And Lawson's like, Heath, what'd you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 what did I do? Yeah. I didn't do anything. Yeah, he just I, pointed up and said, I that's a God up, thing. I said, that's a God thing. Yeah. And, and literally, we didn't do anything. I mean, we, we prayed it on it. The so night many before. times could I have, uh, I guess, blown up that bill with my approach. Right. Um, and it just, see, it, it, I do think it was a God thing because things would happen at a particular time. Right. That would keep me from. And that's a true story. So. Yeah. Like, that's probably a story that, you know, when I'm 80 years old, I'll tell my grandkids yeah. about that story. Just so emotional going through all of that. I, I, I'm just thinking back to it right now. I'm starting to yeah. feel it a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that was such a huge accomplishment. Um, and I'll tell you this. from Coming in as a freshman, the thing I was most surprised about was I thought I would be walking down there, and I'm walking into this swamp. Um, and, you know, everything is the good old boy network. And as we walked in, and I, I thought personally, you know, the the people who were, even though I had ran on stating that I would not join the Freedom Caucus, I thought the people that were most righteous were the Freedom Caucus fighting for their cause. Right. And then we had the caucus meeting, to which a Freedom Caucus member suggested that we add a signature to rules. Um, and then complain that we or made the argument that we were kicking them out of caucus because they would not sign on to the rules. To yeah. me, that, that I saw a lot of virtue signaling and not a lot of virtue in that. Right. And that was just the first of many issues. Um, but I come in there, and then I start thinking about it. And, you know, we're the second largest class in South Carolina history of freshmen. So if you take that, and I'm, I'm not trying to disparage anyone that was there before us or anything else, but you look at it from the outside, you can say, okay, so one-third of the delegation has left. 
Yeah. And we are in there now. So if that one third was the majority of that swamp that left due to seniority, now we've got new we've got a new speaker. We've got new committee members leading things. We've yeah. Got, everyone's new. This is so a I whole thought new that it was unfair to just immediately come in there and start bashing and saying that everything this new session has done um is the same as what our previous sessions or previous legislators right, right. have done. But at the same time, they came in and our agenda as freshmen in a non-election year was by far the most aggressive. It was more aggressive than I could. You could take every conservative's campaign pitch right. and put it in one, and we accomplished just about everything within that first year, a non-election year. Correct. And that's the reason I get so frustrated now whenever you hear people say South Carolina is the bluest red state. Right. Well, no, you're taking stats from previous legislators that were there and trying to use that because the only the only thing that you have to make is, their point. Well, their point is that they're righteous and everyone else is swamp. And it's a it's an outright lie. That is the problem. Yeah. And they're using previous legislators instead of what is currently going on. And what is currently going on is a very strong conservative Correct. Uh, group that is making things happen. And I, and I think our freshman class just speaks to um, folks like us, normal people, just getting involved. I think, yeah. I think when COVID happened and some of the measures that were taken just shocked people. Yeah. You know, I think it was a shock to the system. I mean, it started off not just, bombs for liberty. Yeah, not just the, the our economic systems, our, our government systems. I, ju- I just think having cameras and our kids, that that was the personal one for me. When I saw my, my child virtual school and some of the things that were being taught or – and, again, it, it wasn't so much the subject matter. It was, you know – and to be fair to the school district and to the teachers, man, they were trying to cobble together something. Yeah. You know, so kids could finish. Because this happened, what, February, March of 20? Um, but I think that was some of the things that took me over that summer of 2020. And I'm like, you know, man, we, we can't do this. We, we need folks. It, it seems like there was a lack of common sense. Well, that it- – Everyone thought that they were doing the right thing. The problem is, is some people wouldn't listen to the other side. Correct. And it, it seemed like, you know, the 75% of folks in the middle, and I don't care if you're middle left or middle right, all just sat down and stopped yeah. talking for a while. And man, it seemed like this country just, you know, well, went to a place that we all looked around and were like, what the hell is going on? And so that the responsible voices just left for a little while. And I was like, you know what? I sit here and bitch and moan and I'm being asked to serve the district. Yeah. And I said no a few times. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm too busy. You know, I got a family, businesses to run, a job to do, all those types of things. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. But then it started waking me up. You know what I mean? It started. And I'm like, how can I sit here and, and complain and critique others who are out there. I'm not going to get involved. You're right. You know, and I, and I think that speaks to our class uh, of freshmen. Well, the first, the first conversation that I ever had with you, first time I'd ever met you was over a zoom call. I was running for County council. Um, And it was a, it was a bad pitch or a bad, um, a, a bad presentation. But essentially I called the people of our generation within the area and, and, you know, a lot of our fathers and stuff had done great things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I, you know, my, my presentation was it's time for our generation to stand up. We're right. too busy letting our dads. And that, that becomes my belief on term limits. It's not about someone staying in office for too long. It's about staying in office too long to where you don't allow the new generation to step up and lead. And, it, and, and when you say new generation, I'm not even saying young people. Yeah. It's just fresh eyes on a problem. You know what I mean? It's new perspectives, and that's what term limits. Well, see, I, I mean generations. So, you know, we can sit here. Let, let's use a local example just just um, just so we're on the same page. But if you take, say, Ralph Norman, who's in Congress right now, and mm-hmm. his beliefs, if everyone is in his group that is running things, 
what happens whenever he steps away, the people that are stepping up would be his grandchildren's age, not his kids' age. Yeah, right. You know, and then that creates a generational divide. And I think there's always going to be a, uh, a variance in those views. Whereas if you transition to the kids' generation and then transition to the grandkids' generation, it's more it allows relatable us to and pass on our conservative ideals right. to the next generation as opposed to being the conservative on one age spectrum. And then you've got, you know, even, even Gavin was, you know, a little bit more liberal in a lot of his views. Right. But he was becoming more. I think we uh, all starting were when to we were see. younger. Yeah. Well, I, I tell people I'm the same person I was in high school. I was a rage against the machine then. That just might have been Democrats back then. <laughs> um, but I'm still like fight the system. Yeah. The system is I, my problem. I think that, that's in the water down here, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I, I, mean, I, I don't I don't mind walk, taking a walk by myself sometimes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just when someone says like, oh, man, everybody's doing it. I'm like, eh. yeah. But is it the right thing to do? Is is, is that what's going to serve my district best or the state best or, you know, I, I always want to take a minute to slow down and, and ask questions. Yeah. You know, regardless of. Yeah. And I think you do a good job of that. You pose it to even me whenever I'm adamant about something. It's just, uh, and it's not even that you even believe on the other side. You just pose the question to make me start thinking about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it, like it a makes devil's me advocate, look at, yeah. you know, just trying to, <laughs> Hey, let's look at this from all sides. You know, yeah. If if this is if this is my personal beliefs and, and value set, what is my opposition going to look like? Yeah. You know, just trying to prepare myself for for that argument. So well, you have people. You know, some of the people that we serve with, I'd say like Lawson. Even if he sees something differently, he's sticking to exactly what his belief was, regardless, until he can actually explain to his constituents like this is what I believe. So even if he disagrees, he's still sticking with it. Yeah. Whereas me, I'm always, I, I, you know, I felt bad one time or felt like a politician one time and I voted against my conscience and I swore that's not going to happen again. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you have to face the music whenever what you believe might have changed as opposed to what it was previously. Yeah. And I tell you personally, uh, those behind the scenes moments that folks don't see, you want to talk about just wonderful personal experiences, even when the challenge overwhelms us. Yeah. You know, and, and you'll learn from it. I mean, uh, voters understand we're not perfect, man. We're just people just like they are. Yeah. Um, we make plenty of well, mistakes and, our, our and goal. some, some of it's on the record, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, and, yeah. and it'll get thrown back on us. But, um, but I, I think that speaks measures of folks to say, Hey, I made a mistake on that one. Yeah, you know? I mean, you've got to make the best decision that you have with the information you. at the time. And, and I'm perfectly fine for owning up to any mistakes that I made, or you know, explaining how I voted on something. Right. What I'm not, happy or just how with, you got there. Yeah. What What I'm not happy with is the way that this rumor mill starts up here. Yeah. While you're down there. Right. You know, you come back home, and all of a sudden, you know, I think one of the situations that we had it was over the school redistricting. Oh, and yeah. we're sitting, I'm literally arguing with John King on the floor. Yeah. And I'm getting both text are. messages to state, uh, you know, I hear you're siding with John King. on. It's like, like, are you watching? Yeah. We're like, I mean, what, yeah, yeah. where it, does this come from? It's where live streamed. Are you not looking at the floor debate? Yeah. The, the, probably besides Gavin's law, probably yeah. the only other time you and I were both up at the well. Yeah. You know, advocating for our current five districts. And that's because we're fighting for York County school district. Right and, right. and the point, you know, and I think what John King was saying, he has, you know, he's looking at it on student population, whereas being on county council and having to go through the redistricting before, I, I don't like the fact that we redistrict that has anything to do with race. But bottom line is we have federal laws that we have to that's follow. That's right. That's right. And the minority group always gets their first choice on making sure that every need that they have is satisfied and then it's kind of drawn around everything else. Well, whenever we're talking about school districts, I personally think the way Rock Hill School Districts handles the elections is best because you have two at-large members that represent every district and right. then you have individual members within their district. That's that's correct. That can be held accountable. Um, and what he was trying to do was get rid of the at-large seats and right. break it up into individual districts, which then I believe 
becomes the problem that I ran into on county council, and I was part of the problem while I was on county council because I would look at, at things. As every member's fighting for their individual district right. and not You the got whole. a bunch of little chiefdoms. Right. So I would only worry about like, uh, okay, well, if something's happening in district one, that's not my problem. If that's what they want, then so be it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, this is. These are my voters. Yeah. These are the folks who elected and me. And I only worried about people in District 6. Yeah, Whereas right. if we had a, uh, you know, an at-large person there that can mm-hmm. look at everything countywide, then that's good. Right. Um, and you don't want things that are going to affect everyone countywide to begin with. But whenever it comes to something like zoning for a business in another district, even though I disagree and I wouldn't, um, you know, I know my views are a little bit more extreme on zoning compared to most. I don't believe in zoning. So I don't believe the government should tell you what you can I mean, everybody should have chickens in their yard. But, yeah. You know? <laughs> the chicken key. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I do understand why places like Lake Wiley and Fort Mill are trying to control a little right. bit more of what is coming in there. Um, I just don't like government getting involved and being that control. I believe that capitalism will always win out. You know, my business, my, my landscape supply yard, it, you know, it was a car wash is moving in there. Well, no one, if you look at anybody on social media, they're like, not another car wash, not yeah, another yeah, storage right. facility. You know, I could have pushed that. Is it an auto bill? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, I could have pushed that and kind of used that to my advantage. But I don't believe that the government has the right to say what will be there. Because if a car wash does open there and the people don't want it, then guess what? People won't come. And then that land will with sell. their feet. Right. Yeah. But – I know that that car wash has done its due diligence and it will be successful or else they wouldn't have spent double what I could have afforded to be on that land. Yeah. Right. Um, so but it, that's a risk they could take. Right. You know, well, so. we're getting off topic. We'll move on to the next yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> transition onto the Well, next. so, Sorry. so we talked about first year, man, we were busy. We got, you know, like we talked about certificate of need. We got fentanyl trafficking. We got an education uh, bill over to the Senate. It's still sitting over there in the Senate right now. We did some uh, workforce development uh, bill that actually did get signed into law. Uh, what else did we get done? Um, uh, <laughs> constitutional carry. Constitutional that, carry. That's over in the Senate, right? Yeah, there's a lot that's in the Senate. So we've passed a lot in the House. Um, not everything's been ratified into law. Yep. Um, and at the same time, we've got a lot of Senate bills that are coming in. Yep. Voter safety. Well. Yeah. Um, well, voter safety passed. Yeah, right. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So, so it, it passed completely. I'm just trying to think. And, Which is and, just one and, step. And so for folks to understand, as you're a new member of the legislative body, right off the rip, we're going fentanyl trafficking. Yeah. You know, we're going constitutional carry. We're well hunting. We're going certificate of need. <laughs> we're going economic development. We're doing workforce but honestly, development. honestly, that, that come from leadership. Oh, like, correct. We didn't have to fight for it. Yeah. That was what was so surprising oh. for me because I, did, I didn't know Merle. I, right. I'd maybe talked to him once on the phone prior to coming down there. Yep, and, and, for, and for the listener, you know, the, two of, the two of you may be out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Merle Smith is is the uh, Speaker of the House, and this is his first term. Yeah, and yeah kudos but to, to him. But to come man, in with he, such an aggressive agenda was yeah. just shocking to me. I, I tell you, it, I enjoyed it. I was happy it, and proud of it, right. and yet and to, I, until we, we realized how people. the pace, you yeah. know, because oh, not yeah. not only were we dealing with floor debate and the amendments and just and the committee meetings yeah and, right we were also doing which folks you know may not see we're we're doing subcommittee work yes we're doing full committee work um you know and then we're doing you know we're on regs together regs so um, we literally and for folks who don't know we we all have secondary committee assignments um Brandon and I are both on regs. To get we, rid of regs. Right. We literally <laughs> go through um, current South Carolina state regs and see if we can't do away Eliminate with them. them. Yeah. I that's, mean, essentially, that's and, – and some I, regs are needed, for yeah. sure. But most of the regs – and we talked about this and that whole scout deal. Yeah. How much are they spending for a spotted turtle survey out there? $245,000 yeah. for a spotted turtle survey? I mean, that is something that is costing – so much more money to private businesses. Right. Yeah. Hey, just slows down. I didn't business. realize there was a constituency for the spotted turtle, but yeah. uh, <laughs> give, give me a hundred grand and I'll have them hump <laughs> until we can replenish the entire population. <laughs> but uh but yeah, I mean we were we were busy for sure. Yeah, it 
Well, and in addition to that, so we had coming into the off season. So once we finished up, we got assigned subcommittee or uh, ad hoc committees. Yeah. So you're on a committee called Health Fellows. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, it's a it's a health fellowship. So being on the medical subcommittee, um, there is a health fellowship that me and I'd say probably ten others have, are a part of, and this is sort of a, an annual or biannual fellowship. And basically, what it is, it's three or four sessions. And they bring in, you know, folks, Medicare, Medicaid, and they explain those processes. They explain some of the how we can improve them, um, where they're seeing gaps um, or issues with. Can we figure out the mental health issue? That we, that we, becomes we, the big we talked thing. about that. Yeah. Um, we talked about, you know, we restructured DHEC, yeah. you know, last this past year. So um, just trying to see around the next curve of how do we better – Prepare. Um, well, us restructuring reps. DHEC. I'm going to use that as an example. I think that's a perfect example of every good every law was written with good intentions. Yeah. And if we go back to Mark Sanford, and you know, I was a huge Mark Sanford fan, but now we look at the ramifications of what he did to the mental health in South Carolina and how far behind we are. Right. You know. It, did it really save money? I mean, even whenever you talk about Hey, I'm a big Reagan fan. Yeah. I but mean, very it, similar nationally. Right. You, you look back now historically, you're like, man. So do we just cut out an, uh, an entire, you know, as Ramaswamy would say, the three-letter uh, <laughs> groups, do we cut them out? Or do we try to figure out this is the problem? How do we stop the bureaucracy? And that's one of the things that I get caught up in. And I know, you know, in healthcare, that's huge. Oh, which man. W- the simple task – and I, I always tell people that, um, you know, the big issues, the abortion and it, it, all of the big issues, I consider that the forest. And everyone's focused on the forest because that's what gets them elected. But where I'm most effective is the trees. Right. I focus on an individual tree. And your individual tree this year is itemized billing yeah. from hospitals. Yep. Very simple. And doctor's office. I, I tell you, I like to take complicated issues and simplify them so – our voters, our constituencies understand. Right. And one of those, I tell you, it is a labyrinth trying to figure out why things cost what they do. And then it depends. If you break your arm and you go into the local hospital, depending on who your carrier is, is dependent upon how much you pay. Yeah. So if you don't have insurance, that's a different rate. Or Excuse insurance me. As, like zoning as, to me. I don't believe they should exist. But, you know. <laughs> Until you need it. <laughs> but uh, so as I, I heard, we have a rural health care ad hoc committee. And I was watching some of the video and, and one of the um, one of the folks talking about rural health care. Um, he was explaining to a senator, asking him questions like, now, wait a minute. If I break my arm, why does it matter what my carrier is? Why would I pay different? He's like, well, you don't pay different. It's just some folks get a better discount. Yeah, <laughs> you know? on how many people are on So the it might cost you $10,000 to get your, your arm cast, right, and set. But out of pocket is different depending on. Well, I learned that a pharmacy can't tell you what the cash rate is once they know that you have insurance. Right. And, you know, you might only have to pay $3 out of pocket, but if you got insurance, you got to pay that $10 copay, and then that pharmacy still has to pay $7 back to the insurance company just so the insurance company can make more. Yeah, that's right. Um, those things frustrate me. One yep. of the things I was surprised in healthcare too was that we are required. Well, going to mental health, we've got people that are suffering from mental health mm-hmm. being held in our hospitals. Yes, and they are taking up rooms and beds. board because we don't. We've got twenty eight beds for youth across the entire state. Yes, um, and those are big issues, and we're seeing mental health as being one of the big issues, and that's one of my passions. Right, and because there's those gaps in service. You take something like Piedmont, you take a yeah. hospital, and you take an emergency room bed for someone who's having some mental health problems, you know? And and I'm glad— And they're that, not even really getting help. They're it, just being held and right. protected. And I'm glad that, that those, those folks get at least something, some support, th- those types of things. But it's just trying to get on that—getting into the weeds of those issues. And, man, we got a lot of work to do. So— so, well, I'm so, thankful yeah, I, for what I, you're doing with healthcare. That's for sure. So, I, 
I want to simplify it, right? I, basically, the bill states if you go and get health care services from a facility, I don't care if it's a hospital or an outpatient facility, you have to get an, it's a requirement per this bill that they give you an itemized receipt. That's it. Yeah. And um, if insurance is really saving you money, you should be able to see that you're getting a better rate because correct. you're on insurance. And also, so some of the, the pushback I'm sure I'll hear is hospitals saying, well, well wh- why do they need total pricing transparency? And it, my question would be, why not? Yeah. You know, but what, what I think we're going to see is patients are going to understand that when they go to their local hospital, because they don't have insurance for a cold or a flu, um, they're going to they're going to see the facility fee yeah. of, of twenty five hundred bucks, and they're going to start understanding. Hey, you know what? I should have went to my I urgent prob- care, <laughs> right? Where where the facility fee may be half that, or a third right. of that, or or even more. So the, it, it cuts two two ways. I want it to be. Tr- I think accountability and transparency are just good guiding principles in government. Um, also in business. Yeah. And and this is the, this is a simple way to do that. I think we need to establish itemized billing, full transparency, and if folks can't pay it, then you can go after them to collect. Some of the issues are you have folks who um, go into these facilities, they get the health care that they need, and then get taken to collections because maybe they're a little more transient. Maybe the bill got sent to their old address yeah, and not through their new, you know what I mean? And so those types of real life problems that happen, I don't want people who are struggling financially to get the snowball, just keep, you know, Adding rolling on, on them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I want to put the onus on organized healthcare facilities to, Hey, you have to give them an itemized bill. I mean, no, no other industry you go into and you don't have an itemized bill. And, and the argument against that, and I'm sure I'll hear it, is healthcare isn't like a McDonald's, right? Because there's a there is a make it like Burger King. I want it my way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So federally, you know, there, there's regs that that hospitals have to have 24 seven ER. Yeah. You know, McDonald's doesn't have to be open 24 seven. So, but again, I, I think, I think. Some of those challenges c- can be overcome. I just think it it's going to take serious folks. But, I mean, how much would it help the hospitals to keep their ER from being overwhelmed with people that have a cough? Oh, I, I, I think— Everyone complains about the waiting. I think that's— But the, that's because they're not paying the bill. I, I think pricing transparency is just the first step. Yeah. In, in trying to If they were actually responsible for that bill, costs. they wouldn't be going to the ER because they're running a fever that night. Right, right. So— And then people that are actually— having life or death situations yeah. are sitting out there waiting. Yep. Um, I'm very accident prone. I've been bleeding many a times and <laughs> ER waiting to get in. So what about so, uh and then on my subcommittees, I've got the judicial reform committee that I've been on. Or the oh yeah, yeah, the ad hoc committee. judicial reform. Yeah, so that's been that's, spicy, man. <laughs> you know? It's, I've watched some of that video and uh you know, I'm like, man. I uh, feel like it hasn't been productive. That is the problem. There's as, been a lot of productive or as productive as you want or you expected. There's been so the first meeting I would say roughly summed up to say we had these professors come in that study constitutional law and talk about how we have the best system throughout the country. And I, I, I do believe there is some truth in that because we do not elect judges. Therefore, they are appointed by the legislator and only us and Virginia right. do it that way. Now I do understand, and I do think the problem is with the JMSC and the way that we handle it. Let's pause for a second and and back up. Let's tell people how we elect judges here in South Carolina. Okay, so. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a long process. It's it's not a general. No, but someone applies for it. They go through. There's two screening processes before you get to the JMSC. And the JMSC currently is at three senators, three House members. And then two and appointments from the House two and appointments two appointments Senate. Correct. Yep. Um, and then as a group of 10 individuals that sit and they decide whether someone is qualified to become a judge. Um, yep. 
And through that process, the argument has become, and, and the judges must come up for review again and go before that committee. So the argument has been that we have these lawyer legislators that win a case, and the judges that ruled against them are then deemed as unqualified. Or there are bond hearings given because these judges um, are supposedly scared of the lawyer legislators holding their position. That's that's the argument and the narrative from media. Right. That's and, kind of come out. And when you say argument, you're suggesting that, you know, it, it may or may not have merit. Right. And there are plenty of instances that have merit. I mean, just in York County, I mean, if you look at the the – you know, the fentanyl um, situation, if you look at Larry Vaughn's murder and right. getting bond, I mean, there's there's certain situations, but most of the situations lead, lead back to Todd Rutherford, who is the minority leader and owned the JMSC. Those are the majority of the complaints are coming from one man, right. essentially, right? Um, so, and I ran on judicial reform, thanks to Senator Clymer educating me on how messed up our system was at that yeah. time. And I'm one of the few House reps that did run. I think myself and Joe White both ran on judicial reform. But, of course, mm-hmm. Gavin's Law became my number one um, thing coming in. But I did request to be on that committee. Um, and I think myself and Robbie Robbins are the only two freshmen on there. Um, oh, yeah. But as we're going through, that first meeting was all about how it's corrupt. The second meeting, I mean, was all about how it's the best system. The second meeting with the attorney general and the um, solicitors, the solicitors was basically about and, how and, we and our all solicitor. have the worst system yeah. and the situations. And then the third meeting was, well, we're not going to allow the solicitors to respond, but we're going to continue moving forward. My problem is, is I feel like we're getting off of the, we're getting off of the subject of. We're going off of the the problem of these situations. So we'll use the bond hearing, for an example, in York County. Yeah. This was a judge that gave bond, and whenever he gave bond, they waited for this judge, and they've got jailhouse calls of um, the mother telling the uh, accused – that Todd Rutherford's waiting on the right judge, and then this judge comes in and— And Todd Rutherford is the the lawyer. He's the lawyer. For the accused. That, but, well, he's not the lawyer. He well, was hired just for this He's bond. part of the legal team. Right. So right. He was Jack hired. Swirling, maybe? Yeah, and Jack sat there and testified about how we got a corrupt system, and yet his client's the one who hired Todd, which is one of the problems. I mean, this, this is an issue um, nonetheless, and JMSC needs to be reformed. Um, but in this particular situation, that judge was not up for re-election. So how can you claim that this judge was making a decision because he was fearful that he was not going to be re-elected? When he wasn't well, even up? When he, whenever he's not even up. Right. And what, what fear did he have of Todd Rutherford? And I'm not saying that's not corrupt and the appearance is not there. Right. What I'm saying is it has nothing to do with our judicial selection committee. Well, and I, and— I think that's that's the crux of what we're talking about, the perception of public corruption, right? right. Um, and we got to stay above reproach. No, oh, I totally agree. And, and that, that's always been in, in my conversations with, with colleagues in the House is we have got to eliminate the conflict of interest, right. period. And I, I'm surprised ju- that lawyer legislators can vote on judges that they might appear before. That that is correct. That's and, just the simple. And, and I I will tell a personal story. Um, I am in construction. Last year, for folks who don't know, uh, Volkswagen bought Scout Motors, and that's their their EV line. And Scout announced that they were coming to South Carolina to set up their manufacturing plant in Blythewood, South Carolina. Well. On a private side, I was bidding some of the civil work for that project. But you didn't even know it was for that project. People nope. need to understand that because how oh, easy yeah, yeah, it would yeah, have been right. able to charge you with corruption You're, whenever you thought you were bidding on something completely different. Yeah, yeah. So in in <laughs> in projects of this size, scope, and, and impact, um, we were told, I think they called it Project Horsepower or Project X or Stingray. They give them sort of these these code names. But you thought it was a solar farm. We thought it was a solar farm, right. 
So, so my, my company thought it was solar farm. We had walked it, thought, you know, we were in a good position to get some of the work and then we get pulled in and, and house leadership says, Hey guys, we got a big announcement coming out tomorrow. It's going to be public and let us know it will scout motors. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I say all that to say because of my personal or private interest in Scout Motors locating to, to Blythewood. Sorry, I'm adjusting the mic. Yeah, yeah, That's right. That's squealing is. <laughs> um, I didn't vote on it. Yeah. Regardless of how I felt on it, if it was good, bad, or indifferent idea. But it would have been so simple for you to not put two and two together to understand that this project is the same as what you were bidding on. Yeah, right. And then all of a sudden be charged with some ethical violation that you had uh, right. no clue. Yeah, correct. But, you know, and again, that's why you, we've got to have higher standards. Yeah. You know, I, and I'm just saying personally, I would rather have credibility. Right. And, and folks understand that I, I won't be corrupted. Um, I will not vote for personal gain. Yeah. Don't mix the two. And I'm not suggesting that we have folks in, in, in the House or on JMSC that does that. But you've got to eliminate the naysayer or any critic saying, hey, we've got whoever on JMSC, and they also won a big criminal defense case in front of that judge. Yeah. Well, you know, you're just giving folks ammunition yeah. to come at you. So – and. and I wish it was as simple as no lawyer legislators or give folks the choice. Don't don't say lawyer legislators can't serve on JMSC. It's, hey, you can serve on JMSC, but then if you choose to accept that position, you cannot argue cases in that court yeah. where that judge presides. But what happens if that's your firm? Then, so then you need, Does your firm have to recuse itself? Hey, then you need to make a decision yeah. that best is best for you as a lawyer. Right. Legislator. And if I'm a lawyer legislator, I give up voting on a judge of being a member of what, I don't, uh, 160, yeah. 170. I don't sit on JMSC. Yeah. If I'm a lawyer legislator and it's to, hey, I need to provide for my family or sit on JMSC, that's an easy, yeah. That's an easy decision for me. So, well, as, um, as Mr. Swirling said, it has, he hasn't seen it be an issue previously. But over the past decade, it has become an issue of attorneys simply saying, you want me because I am a lawyer legislator. Right. And, you know, I've heard in, in some, of your, the, some of the video from your ad hoc judicial reform committee is, for folks who don't know, as a member of the General Assembly, we have lawyer legislators basically have a free pass. Like they will not be in court. Yeah. From January to June. Yeah. So it creates a challenge. Which that sounds horrible, but it was put in place because other legislators would force these legislators to show up in court on a day of an important vote. So that way they could whip the votes that they needed. <laughs> so, I mean, that system was put in place for a reason. So the solution is not to get rid of that entire yeah, right. um, immunity for those lawyer legislators. Right. So, so you have... You know, basically January from June blacked out or off limits to some lawyer legislators who. But they're they're doing more than that. They're taking it two years, like oh, even in the off season. Oh, correct. And then in the off season, they're 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 busy doing. I had to show up to Hilton Head. For yeah, yeah, networking for a reception yeah. <laughs> or a, a junket. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and so you have folks who have committed felonies, who they still, get two years free. Yep. Of house arrest or whatever it may be, which just because then, they're waiting to which get it. Then that time sitting on house arrest is then. They revoke their bond. Is still equivalent. So when yeah. you finally do get them as a solicitor, when you finally do get them convicted of, say, a five year sentence, well, three years they've already been in their house. Yeah. So really they're only in they're jail for to two give years. Them two time served, which we have, we have legislation to not count house arrest as time served. Looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I mean, so we, we've got a lot of legislation coming up. And what I, what my personal opinion as a freshman, as one of the, I would say, one of the weaker members on this entire committee, um, I believe that we will 
offer a different solution for JMSC. Now, the other thing that was given to us and, and the problem that I have is the recommendation is to allow the governor to do the appointments of JMSC, which yeah. sounds great. But the other issues that we have are with magistrates. And yeah. technically, by law, the governor appoints magistrates. And we're complaining about reform. How about just hold the governor responsible for him appointing magistrates and making sure that they're back on there? Because that becomes my issue is if the government's already doing a crappy job with magistrates, then why are we giving him power over the legislature on these judges? Because the majority of the complaints are actually with magistrates Mm -hmm. and them um, essentially not getting renewed and the legislators are using that. Or they have holdover. Yeah, so they're using that holdover and not renewing. And the governor is not forcing these legislators to go ahead and say, we need to get this taken care of. Yeah. So why do we want to give the governor, and, and granted, our system typically is the Senate recommends, and then the governor just signs off on it. Yeah, correct. But by the code of the law, the governor is the one responsible. So if there's a complaint with it, it falls on the shoulders of the governor. So why would we give the governor the appointment so of people of the JMSC? What, what's a reasonable outcome? What, what do you expect to come out of the recommendations. I think from that the- I think the governor will. In my personal opinion, I think the governor will have appointments, um, and it will lower the number of House and Senate members. Okay. Um, and I think that we will be looking at term limits. So therefore, if a JMSC member appointed a judge, that judge will not come back up for renewal before the same JMSC members. Now, that's everyone seems to think that's the problem. My concern is is I believe judges should always be held to a higher standard. If they are already claiming, you know, if the claim is that judges are influenced by the, by the power of these legislators, right. then you're taking the members off so they don't know who of 124 they might appear before for their renewal. Will they not become more gun-shy and give that, won't that give more legislators power instead of just the members that are on JMSC. So you've got to look at it from all sides. And yeah. and I want judicial reform, but the question is, is what is the best solution? I, and I agree. And, and and I'm playing a little bit of that devil's advocate that, uh, you yeah. know, he Sessions has taught me <laughs> at times. But it's, it's truly trying to think through, because as with anything in politics, I think the majority of those meetings are getting caught up in rhetoric that has nothing to do with what we are tasked to do there. Yep. That's and cool. and that's from both sides. Yeah, totally and, and we're wasting, you know, five, six hours each time we get together. Yep. Now, in addition to that, both of us have been assigned to the AI Cyber Subcommittee, yep. which is the first of its kind. Yeah, yeah. But before we get there, let's okay. – so we're, we're talking about this judicial merit – uh, selection committee, oh, uh, we get we get that final report January the sixteenth. Yeah. So, not in the first week, but the second week, and uh, at noon. And so that's officially when their election process kicks off. And um, well, this did could you, all, this could you, all uh, be let me this, ask you this, this could all be for not too. An because, honest assessment. Did you read the entire JMSC report whenever it came out last year? Not last year. I did not either. No. And I think the majority of the people who are in the news making the complaints, I would argue that they didn't read the report. Yeah. And there might have been information in there that would have given them more. Now, granted, by the time it comes to vote, that's the other problem, is everyone recuses themselves, and then you are only got one person really to vote <laughs> on. Um, but I don't know how you really Well, and, you know, we, we may be up for a, a live a live debate or not on judges uh, because our, our colleague Clymer. in the Senate, yeah. you know, uh, Senator Wes Clymer has vowed to uh, filibuster. And if he says all, it, he's going to do it. Yeah, you yeah. can guarantee that. All judge elections uh, except for – uh, the Chief Justice, uh, John Kittredge. <laughs> so, um, you know what I have loved, and I don't know how it was before we got there with Clymer, but I, I do love the fact that it seemed that everyone had, if there was a one man Freedom Caucus in the, in the Senate, it was Wes Clymer. Yeah. Like he kind of seemed to be on his own, fighting against everything. And then it's like Early once on. we're getting there, 
it's, it's understanding and seeing, like, I, I don't know how many people you've had come to you, but I know how many people I've had come to me that might have served with Wes in the past. And they're like, oh, he's not at all how I thought he was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and just realizing like where he's coming from. And I tell people all the time, Climber is one of those people that, uh, you know, smart guy. Well, he's one of the politicians that I very rarely disagree with. And whenever I do disagree, he tells me why I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and can kind of convince me of it. I mean, he's he's just very articulate. Um, everything is thought thought out. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, he's one of those guys I'd follow in the war. <laughs> so I, I fully support him. And it's amazing to see other House members starting to see that side of Wes. As well. Yeah. So, so we talked about some of that stuff. Do you have any – any goals for this year? I mean, whether it's personal or any bills that you've looked at. I mean, because I know you and I have been working in the off season yeah. together. Um, I've submitted we, many. We have a men's breakfast at my yeah. church at Oakland Baptist on what is it? Twenty first. Yeah, twenty first, twentieth, or twenty first. Whatever that Sunday morning is that folks would be welcome to come out to. It's a men's breakfast eight a.m. Um, at Oakland at Oakland Baptist here in Rock Hill, um, and we're talking about some of the passion projects that you and I have in regards to social media. So, yeah, I mean, I've got one, one bill that I've worked with, um, with representative Caskey that requires, um, a rating system for books. You know, I don't understand this argument of saying this is an adult, uh, this has adult content. Well, we do it with movies. Why can't we do it with books? Right. And just put a rating system. And if it's not child a good friendly, rating system, yeah, just something be, simple. And yes, it oh, would be no, no. a pain in the tail for it, the first couple of years. It's real simple. Um, if you can't read it yeah, at a school board meeting, it shouldn't be in the children's <laughs> section. Yeah. And it shouldn't be in the, the PG 13 section. I tell you, man, this, this is some of the things that we, we, we debate about. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You can't say that. And just as you can take your child to a that would get bleeped movie, out in a in a local news interview, right? What are you and, talking about? And yet you and have you want to give it to an eight year old? Yeah, yeah, that's it's very frustrating to me. And but on the other side, you have people taking the situation that happened in California and making it sound like that teachers here are doing that. So oh, then right. then that because that causes the teachers to become defensive of it as you are attacking me, and I've been doing this for 20 years, yeah. and that's not the case. But well, bottom that, line is we talk about being proactive instead of reactive, and I think that legislation like this allows us to be proactive. So if it's not happening, then what's the problem with the bill? Yep, yep. All so, this does is ensure that it doesn't happen, and if it does, these are the ramifications. Okay, so you got that. I know we have a, we have a social media bill for minors. Yes, um, we've got and That's, we've got the lack of tracking data for minors. Yeah. Um, I've got a... I tell you, the social media, when I started digging everything into it last, Jan- social. last January, looking into, you know, because you want to pass a bill that's clean, right? Yeah. Um, but man, this social media bill, the more and more I started working on it last year, man, it became like an omnibus type thing. You know, it's, okay, minors uh, under the age of 16 can't have their own account, social media, right? That's, so that's one. I'm going to say I'm gonna say that we save this for our next episode. Okay. Because there are so many bills on social media and cyber. Yeah. And we've got our first and we'll AI have, yeah, and cyber right. uh, committee. So I think that we save that. All right. And let's then just talk about Let's just schedule. move on to what's going on to cuz we're we're just over an hour now. We there wanted, you go. we wanted to keep it to about an hour, yep. hour 15 tops. Okay. And let's we'll just talk, talk about, about this what's week. coming up this week. All right. So this week uh first week back um down in the house uh and the Senate um on the floor we have a on Tuesday we have a House Bill 3989 it's a bill um regarding, uh, I think, some regulations on solar farms. I talked to Russ a lot about that. Yeah. He's thinking that is going to be, um, that debate's going to be suspended to a later date. Um, there's also a Senate voting bill. Voting ballots. Yep, regarding counting of early voting ballots with absentee. Um, obviously, that's been a very important issue. I tell you, all the stuff that's coming out. About We've got a couple of rallies coming up on Tuesday as well. We've got the paper ballot group. Oh, that's yeah. going to hold a rally. Okay. We've got, um, I think we've got some teachers down there. And we've got the transgender community coming down for their yep. rally. And, and that, that goes into what I'll be working um, on directly in medical subcommittee. Um, the gender reassignment. 
procedures. Yeah, yep. So House Bill 4624 um, is is a bill with, with many sponsors, but basically nuts and bolts is um, anyone under the age of 18 um, cannot have gender reassignment uh, surgery. They cannot have gender reassignment procedures. So what about the that's, that's no hormone, hormone blockers? That's no hormone blockers. Yeah. That's no cross-sex hormones. Um, none of those types of things. Um, and I'm, I'm, and we, my email's blowing up. I don't know if oh yours man. is from oh, doctors. Ah. Matter of fact, I'm speaking with the pediatricians at their conference in yep. January, and I'm sure I'm going to get eat up on this as well. And, you know, typically the, the simplistic view of this is that I don't believe government should have um, you know, I don't want to give government that power to state what you can and can't do. But at the same time, whenever we have medical professionals that seem to be having trouble defining what a man and what a woman is, and, and to me, my personal opinion is adding on to the mental health crisis that we have by affirming that these people are caught in another body, right. then not only does your patient need mental health, you need mental health if you're affirming this. Well, and, and, and that's, you know, we're going to hear both sides of the debate. Yeah. Um, I have my personal feelings on this as well. Um, I, don't, I don't even know how we got here. Um, you know, going back to, I just don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, you know, if, if you have. Well, and I've got two gay brothers. So I, I yep. spoke to one of my brothers about this just to get his opinion because, you know, I don't know what it's like to feel like you have to hide who you are growing up. Mm-hmm. And I do understand that. My heart goes out. Yeah. The argument that everyone comes to me with me losing a child to suicide is, well, this is increases suicide. And it's like, well, if every kid comes to you and says, well, if you don't allow me to do these drugs, I'm going to commit suicide. You don't say, well, we're going to allow drugs just because you're going to commit suicide. Like, it, that's a that hostage situation. Right. I know. And, and I want these kids and these families to get all the support and help they need. Right. I just don't know how. And my questions have taken me down a rabbit hole of, it, it, where does this medical solution come from? Is this something that the, uh, you know, the medical association came up with? Well, perhaps, when, when perhaps the old, solution is litigation. If we just simply allow the doctors to be sued for any decision that they make, yeah. they can be personally held liable. If they allow this 12-year-old and then that 12-year-old becomes 19 and says, look, I was an idiot. I can't believe my parents yeah. let me do this. I can't. And, and there's plenty of people like that. That are coming out. I mean, yeah. you had the oh, help yeah, not absolutely. harm situation in Spartanburg where they come out and literally said, I should not have been able to make this decision. Yep. I was a child. Well, My parents were wrong. The doctors were wrong. And yet, if the doctor can't be held liable, and if the doctor's willing to put their entire livelihood on the line to make that decision, then I say, so be it. Leave the government out of it. Just allow them to be sued personally. Yeah, correct. And 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 that's what 4624 is, is help not harm. It, it's, yeah. it's trying to give... Is that Hyatt's... Yeah, yeah. There's there's, I think, there's there's a couple of different ones, but Hyatt's is the one that I think is going to be heard. Yes. Yep. This is on the agenda. Uh, yep. I think we're going to be hour and a half after we adjourn. We I'm signed on the other one, not that one. Yeah. So you'll you'll have plenty of time for it. Right yeah. Across the desk, but um, yeah. So we got that one, and then we also have the 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 xylazine. Uh, yeah. Right. At, just better if you don't know what that is, zombie drug. Yeah, if you don't know what that is, just look up Pennsylvania and that word. Yeah, and or, you'll see people looking like zombies walking up down yep. the road, and their whole what is it? Their legs turn into just yeah, dead man. skin. Like, yeah, it's bad. So yeah. I I don't know if we've seen that a lot here in South Carolina, but again, speaking proactively, we're going to go ahead and try to reclassify it. Schedule three. I'm tired substance. of waiting, and I believe in less less government. And I, I have this problem whenever it comes to Gavin's Law or anything else. Yeah. But I'm all for whatever government it takes to protect children, and especially whenever it seems like so many parents nowadays are more interested in being friends instead of being parents, and the laws are not holding them accountable. My pastor and I were just talking about this yeah. this morning. So, I, coffee, I, I, so, you know, I want freedom if you're above 18, but it, we've got to stop these things from coming. And I'm, I'm sick and tired of us looking and saying, what is Utah doing? What is Louisiana doing? What is, you know, what yeah, is right. Florida doing? I want people to say, whenever they think of how to protect children, I want them to say, what is South Carolina doing? Well, and, and that's a good segue into this new ad hoc committee that we're both on, yeah. the, the, the AI ad hoc committee. Um, I think it was a great step in the right direction for the state of South Carolina. I commend uh, Speaker Smith and leadership going ahead and, and getting this set up with 
I think with the intent that this is going to be a stand-up if I could committee. Quit, yeah, if I could quit every committee <laughs> and just focus on this, right. I would. I mean, this is like the new frontier yeah. for a lot of stuff, whether it's privacy, medical rights, um, criminal behavior. I mean, uh, you know, stalking, protecting our children. I just think it is throwing as much against the wall as possible to bring these companies to the table. Yep. Because I believe that what they are doing, and this is a bad way of putting it, but the only way I know to put it, is companies like Meta are doing nothing more than blowing air up your skirt to make you think that they are doing, making changes with things like takeitdown.org, whereas it does nothing. And instead, they're doubling down and they're using, um, you know, end-to-end encryption messaging to try and alleviate their liability instead of worrying about truly protecting children. Yeah, I, you know... Last year, I had, a, and you did too, we had a lot of conversations with, with them about trying to partner with us because we needed to understand. Well, my, my first comment was either get in line or you can get offline in South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I think followed by a middle finger and walking back in the yeah, chamber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about our experience on the, on the first meeting of AI. We have a lot of social media stuff going on. We have a lot of age verification for adult content yeah. websites. Um, pre-filed so we'll learn a lot this week but um man this has been great. great yeah i know it's been great i think it's uh i don't know if folks are going to l- listen to the whole hour and 15 yeah. or but well that's not bad at all but you know this na- is for a kickoff now we don't have well we do have video i wasn't even paying attention to that yeah yeah yep and uh, and again thanks to our sponsors uh yeah. schiller hamilton law firm appreciate the uh the home base here. Yeah. For the, Com- for, for Comer the distributing. Yeah. Um, you know, Chip and Comer have always uh Yeah, what'd you think about the good. beer, man? I actually like it. And you know, I, I, I know. I, I even told Heath I'm not a foo foo beer, which is what I call all these uh independent no, breweries. I, I am I, I like my beer to taste like water. I guess you can say I'm not really a beer drinker. Um, so I like it to be very watery, not very strong, and just yeah. have a little bit of a hoppy flavor to it. Yep, um, but I'm not wanting to drink a beer and then get buzzed or feeling oh yeah tipsy afterwards. No, but yeah, Sycamore Southern Girl Blonde Ale. Yeah, it's full Very flavored, good. man. I hadn't finished mine yet. And, so it, I'll and finish it, it in a minute. I, I just I was a little ahead of you. <laughs> That's my competitive nature. <laughs> but uh, I'm but, sure you'll finish it. Finish yeah, 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 before I do. But um, thank you all right. for tuning in. Yep. And uh, see you next we're going to try to make this a weekly thing and see what we can we'll see uh, what happens. I think it'll be great to go back and listen to hear where we stood on issues before they ever got to the floor because yeah. we didn't have this last year. No. And there's many a times where we felt one way. And yeah. then after hearing all the testimony and going through things, you're like, you know what? That person was right. That yeah. person made a, made a solid point that made me rethink right. where I should be standing on. Yep. This. So this is either going to be a, a fantastic idea or a terrible <laughs> it, yeah. it could be political suicide. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I don't think either one of us care about being lifelong politicians. No, so no, that'll be the good thing. So.